This evening we are really in the midst of something. And we are dealing with a subject which has taxed the ingenuity of some very able minds. Among them, Mr. Arthur Edward Waite. I think we need, in this case, to say a little something about the author of the book we are going to consider. Uh, Mr. Waite was one of the outstanding writers of his time in the otherwise neglected field of the esoteric arts and sciences. His production in this area was prodigious. And as author, editor, translator, and preface writer, he made available to English-speaking people many rarities of early philosophy and European mysticism that might not yet be available to us. We are most appreciative for his inspiration in contributing to the translation of the Museum Hermeticum, for example. And we likewise deeply appreciate his industry in making available the two large folio volumes on the alchemical writings of Paracelsus. We remember him also as the translator of the French transcendentalist, Eliphas Levy. We also know that uh, Mr. Waite was a mystic and poet in his own right. In his book of poems of mystery and vision is an entirely commendable work. We also know from his general literary style that he was a man of ability in these areas. And from his research material, that he was by nature a good student. And with the available material in the library of the British Museum at his disposal, he has preserved for us a wonderful bibliography of authors, texts, and books that might otherwise remain comparatively unknown to the modern student. Down through the years, I have gradually assembled the greater part of his original reference material, so that probably 80% of the books that he quotes, particularly in the volume under consideration this evening, we have in the original editions. These different activities also relate to another line of his thinking. He was a prominent English Mason and wrote considerably on Freemasonry, including encyclopedic works dealing especially with the British point of view on things Masonic. Uh, he had very little sympathy for the American point of view on almost any subject and was essentially first, last, and all the way along an English gentleman with a profound admiration for everything English. Well, as most of his authors were not English, this should not have caused any great amount of consternation. But in looking along and in following many of the difficult courses which he attempted to follow, we do not always find that we can come in accord with his conclusions. All through his writings, we find a peculiar note that detracts from uh, the seriousness which the subjects might justify. For example, in his translations of the writings of the French transcendentalist, Eliphas Levy, Levy uh, who was actually a French priest by the name of Abbe Louis Constant. Waite does an excellent translation and then in the preface apologizes for the original author. He explains definitely that he is not to be 
held responsible for the innumerable mistakes made by the good abbe in his original texts. This is a rather curious point of view. We don't know who is on the defensive, uh, but it looks as though Mr. Waite is very concerned over his reputation. Uh, this was Love's labor lost, however, as the very field in which he was operating must inevitably have ruined his reputation outside of a small group of sympathetic friends. The uh, corporate image of Mr. Waite therefore arises as an individual uh, with a good scholarly mind and a powerful body of preconceptions. Uh, his work on the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross first appeared in 1924, and I secured my copy in the spring of 1925 when the book was still fresh from the press. Reading it at that time, I noticed in looking it over a few days ago, I made a couple of notes on the title page. Uh, a poor habit, but I didn't intend this book for resale. Uh, the uh, note that uh, is pertinent to the situation is my finding in the first reading of the book. Mr. Waite reasons from conclusions and not toward them. And this, I think, is generally his dilemma throughout nearly all of his writings. He is so desperately for afraid that he will not be respectable. He is so desperately frightened lest his scholarship be questioned that he moves along in a state of caution that becomes, to a degree at least, a little ridiculous considering the nature of the subject matter. Of all his publications, I suppose this book, which was one of his last, might uh, have caused him the greatest difficulty. He undoubtedly had been gathering notes and relative matters for a long time, as his first written work appeared in 1887. Therefore, we have a considerable literary career. Uh, not too long ago, the uh, original papers, manuscripts, and so forth of Mr. Waite were offered at auction and brought a substantial sum. I did not bid on them because most of the manuscripts had already appeared in book form. But uh, throughout his work writings, we find that caution leads him almost inevitably to a strong point of negation. In his effort to be sure that he is not supporting something that is not right, he finally ends up by supporting nothing. Uh, this is not unreasonable, considering the obscuration of the field, but it still leaves us with the mystery about which the book is built remaining unsolved. All he seems to be able to do with it is harvest the winds. This uh, end in itself is not of great importance. The important thing is that he has preserved for us uh, the necessary titles, names, and publication dates of practically every important text in the field. This makes possible that others may follow after him, and picking up the threads of his particular interests may uh, unravel them further. Now, as the book deals primarily with the subject of the Rosicrucians, I think we should try to orient ourselves a little bit in his thinking on the subject. The burden of Mr. Waite's feelings are the burden is that the Rosicrucian organization was a mystical society completely and entirely esoteric. Uh, that uh, almost every contender for a place in the membership of the society was either an optimist or a fraud. That actually practically every book written in the last hundred years on the subject of Rosicrucianism is a monstrous absurdity. 
uh, that uh, all our authors, except himself, are highly prejudiced. Uh, he is different. He is just prejudiced against everybody. This uh, situation uh, must cause us to review a little some of his special findings in an effort, if possible, to see what we can do with the material he offers us. Always remembering that his quotations are probably correct and his interpretations on them probably incorrect, we have a wonderful opportunity in reading such material to preserve our own reference frame. We can resist the temptation to drift along with our author. Uh, we can pause and reflect, and in this way perhaps attain considerable mental discipline out of a book which, if read without criticism, might prove rather uh, disintegrating to a point of view. For example, early in his work, he begins to shatter uh, the conclusions and uh, foundations that had been built during the 18th, 19th, and the first decade of the 20th century. These conclusions pointed rather definitely to certain possible sources for Rosicrucianism. I concur with Mr. Waite fully in his realization that this society was not, as a society, an ancient institution, that all efforts to give it a mythological antiquity are essentially futile, that even with the best possible research, we are unable to trace it back earlier than the opening years of the 17th century. We must, however, clearly differentiate between Rosicrucianism uh, as a formal organization and Rosicrucianism as a possible descent of mysticism, which in its proper right goes back a very long time. If, therefore, we wish to assume that the principles apparently concealed beneath the enigma of the Rosy Cross, if we consider these principles as ancient, we will be well justified. If, however, we consider the organization to be ancient, uh, we have absolutely no ground on which to stand. And I also am inclined to agree with Mr. Waite that uh, we cannot permit psychic revelation to fill this gap. Uh, we cannot assume that someone in a trance is, is able to produce a valid history unless in that trance something is communicated by which reasonable investigation can be stimulated. Uh, the uh, idea of trying to fill these gaps with romance will not actually advance any cause to any great degree. In the uh, study of the origin of the society, most scholars have assumed that the original documents of the Rosicrucian Society were published by a German theologian who was uh, the religious and spiritual counselor of the Duke of Wittenberg, one Johann Valentin André. Uh, Mr. Waite dismisses this concept as being entirely incredible because it would require that the so-called chemical marriage of Christian Rosenkreutz, one of the earliest documents of the society, was written when André was only 24 years old. And Mr. Waite regards this as an absurdity. He feels that uh, a work of this pretension of this uh, depth, of this importance, could only have been the production of either a very mature person or one uh, of a group having considerable knowledge in common. I read The uh, Chemical Marriage of Christian Rosenkreutz, and this particular point of view that Mr. Waite advances uh, does not seem uh, to be valid so far as I am able to understand. Uh, Andre had available to him at that time 
an enormous quantity of alchemical and mystical literature. He uh, rose to uh, literary distinction at a time when there was a very large output of books dealing upon the general themes of his interest. A bright young man uh, taking this material could certainly have compiled the work which he produced. For well, this work is not exceptionally profound. It is not impossibly deep or incredibly wise. Uh, its uh, real uh, place in the literature of its time is determined almost entirely by its title. Therefore, has, if the word Christian, words Christian Rosenkreutz had been left off, this particular volume would have been only another remnant of early modern reform literature. In favor of the Andre hypothesis, there are certain other points uh, that we might mention. One of these is the relationship uh, between Andre and Bacon. And here, Mr. Waite really has a bad time. It is obvious from the beginning that our English author is no Baconian. Uh, he regards the entire Baconian hypothesis as completely and entirely ridiculous. Here again, I sympathize with him, but I don't agree with him. The reason I don't agree with him is that certain definite links have been established. These are the links Mr. Waite ignores, or else did not know them. And in either case, uh, they, uh, they represent valid evidence that um, there might be more to this phase of the subject than he is willing to admit. Now, the hypothesis that Lord Bacon might have been the founder of the Rosicrucian Society is at the outset not particularly attractive. Uh, in the first place, uh, the Bacon-Shakespeare controversy has caused a powerful alignment of opinions. And, of course, most of the scholarly opinion is on the side of Willie Shakespeare although I see that this is now being affected by the popular purse. Uh, the uh, Shakespearean Museum at Stratford-on-Avon is now asking for 250,000 uh, pounds to enlarge premises and facilities and make way for a larger tourist trade. Uh, several uh, individuals who might have something to do with finding the 250,000 pounds have uh, journeyed over to Stratford and taken a look around. Uh, they have come back and their general opinion is that the Stratford Museum is about the largest fraud of its size in the world. That there is absolutely no evidence or proof in that museum that even one relic is authentic. And as to whether or not the building is the correct one, this is also largely open to question. And the general feeling is now that uh, it is hardly even possible that the immortal bard ever set foot in the Shakespeare house. It's not even certain that it was built at that time, but no one seems to worry too much about it. Na uh, naturally, we may expect a considerable tempest in a teapot over this particular issue, but in all probabilities, practical considerations will prevail and the funds will be raised simply because whether the relics are any good or not, people are perfectly willing to come and see them and pay moderately for the privilege of sitting in Willie's chair. Now, it happens that this chair has already been sold twice and taken out of the country, and it's still there. So you can uh, try to solve these mysteries. They're almost, they're almost as difficult to explain as the miraculous uh, multiplication of the bones of saints which have a tendency to show up, and one saint, I believe, has already known to have had seven skulls. This uh, difficult situation seems also to apply to the Shakespeare dilemma. We must also realize that young people have done rather well in their time. Young William Henry Ireland, a boy of 17, forged 
a complete Shakespearean play, and the immortal Samuel Johnson got down on his knees and kissed the edge of the manuscript. So youth does not necessarily deny precocity. The um, situation then involving the Baconian hypothesis is largely colored by other matters. And uh, we, we're not too sure of the ground on which we stand. Actually, there are many parallels between uh, the so-called adventures of our father CRC, the mysterious Christian Rosenkreutz of the chemical marriage, and uh, the somewhat better known Lord Verulam. Uh, these parallels were, however, advanced by the wrong people. Uh, they were advanced by enthusiasts. Uh, they were advanced by persons wearing the wrong school tie and things of that nature, and as a result were generally discredited. But whether they were advanced by wise or foolish men, the facts must stand on their own feet. That there was a link between Andre and Lord Bacon seems to be part of our basic mystery. So I might mention a little episode that some of you may remember, but which others may not have come across in our writings. Back in 1926, 7 and 8, when I was working on this large book which I did on symbolism, word came to me that uh, one of the oldest and most important Masonic lodges in England, the Mother Kil Kilwinning Lodge of Scotland, had a very rare portrait of Lord Bacon as an old man. Uh, of course, uh, his lordship is supposed to have died at 66, but this portrait was supposed to be a picture of him at much greater age. The thought intrigued me, and full of youth and exuberance, I wrote the Mother Kilwinning Lodge through their secretary and asked if they had such a picture, and if so, they would be gracious enough to send me a copy of it. Uh, they were gracious enough, and uh, shortly after, the picture arrived. The picture was that of an elderly bearded gentleman with a long white beard and a black skull cap, and underneath and around the picture was the inscription, Johann Valentin André. I thought perhaps they'd sent me the wrong picture, so I wrote back and asked them if this was the picture of Bacon, and they assured me that it was. Now, what the Mother Kilwinning Lodge of Scotland might happen to know about this, I'm not too sure, but they seemed to feel that they knew what they were sending me. And uh, such an illustrious body uh, would not like to be passed off lightly. Another interesting point in relationship to this situation is found in the writings of John Burton, who were published anonymously under the title of Democritus Jr. The work which he did was called The Anatomy of Melancholy. And this, uh, as the name sounds, was a most uh, nostalgic volume, which today would be a, a good textbook for certain specialists in abnormal psychology. But the book was full of all kinds of interesting notes and news. And as one man who contributed so many books and manuscripts to the Folger Library in Washington told me, he said, many of us believe that this was originally Lord Bacon's scrapbook. But in any event, it is accredited to a Mr. Burton, a very reverent gentleman of the Church of England. On one page of this book, uh, there is a reference to Christian Rosenkreutz, or the mysterious Father CRC. After this is the usual mark indicating a footnote, and below is the footnote. Johann Valentin Andre, comma, Lord Verulam, period. Now this does not appear in all editions of the book, however, but it does appear in certain earlier editions. The only work that we know that describes the tomb of Christian Rosenkreuz uh, outside of the actual Rosicrucian manifestos is a work on mathematical magic by a Dr. Wilkins. 
who was a member of the society uh, which later became the, uh, the Royal Society of England and which, as Pratt points out, was inspired by Bacon. Wilkin, Wilkins, in his book, describes the tomb with the ever-burning lamp in the ceiling and calls it the tomb of our illustrious brother, Francis Rosycross. Of course, Francis was Bacon's first name. And uh, certainly Francis is not, by any chance, a form of Christian. The manifesto says Christian Rosenkreutz. Wilkins, presumably with no typographical error in mind, calls him Francis Rosycross. There are numerous little odds and ends like this which Mr. Waits chooses to totally ignore. And therefore, I am not sure that he makes a, a strong case to prove uh, that the Rosicrucian enigma uh, had no place in the life of Lord Bacon. Also, if we remember the manifestos, Christian Rosenkreutz died uh, over a hundred years before the mysterious opening of his tomb. As this tomb was supposed to have been opened in the early years of the 17th century, the mysterious founder had been dead quite a long while. Uh, in the, Dr. Burton's dear old book already referred to, however, there is the statement, the founder of the Rosy Cross, still living. Now this doesn't uh, quite fit in to uh, the picture, uh, for he couldn't be still living if the original text was correct. There seems to be no doubt in anyone's mind who really thinks this enigma through that uh, a group of persons, uh, perhaps definitely agents of esoteric orders, perhaps descendants uh, through the troubadours and the temple, of ancient mystical associations did get together in the beginning of the 17th century and formed a fraternity of some kind. Uh, it has been said of Lord Bacon that he rang the bell that brought the wits together, and there seems to be something of this nature involved in our controversy. There were only certain men of this time if they had any reputation in letters at all, who can be intimately associated with a project of this nature. Uh, the uh, actual texts of the society issued between 1614 and 1616, uh, all of them are dated by their content. Even the chemical marriage is dated. It is dated to a way of life, to a point of view, and this dating definitely coincides with the Protestant Reformation. These works could only have come into existence after the rise of Lutheranism. We must therefore suspect that these books issued from some Protestant background. Uh, it would be almost incredible that they could have issued from any other background inasmuch as the very manifestos themselves indicate that the founder of the society brought back his knowledge and wisdom from the Arabs and from the Moslems, uh, which for most of Orthodox Europe would have been an unhappy background and not likely to cause confidence at that time. We had to have some group of intellectual liberals. Also, it is quite obvious from the text of the work that they centered around the concept of a universal reformation of mankind. They centered around the entire theory of the passing of an old way of life, that a new world was coming into existence, a world of new values, new human relationships, and that the fama and confessio fraternitatis were heralding in a great world change. Uh, this world change was naturally part of the period of, of which we are concerned, 
for actually the opening years of the 17th century differentiate the medieval period from the modern world. Of his discovery of the blood, the rise of the um, philosophy of Bacon and Rene Descartes, uh, the emergence of the beginning of our scientific knowledge of astronomy, the creation of the Royal Society, or the exploration of all of the natural history of mankind. These movements were all part of what was referred to then as the way of tomorrowness, a looking into the future and the gradual building of a great structure of world knowledge founded upon the firm foundation of the inductive system of reason. Now, who would likely be able to spearhead such a movement? Only a person who had this look of tomorrowness, who was himself in some way concerned with the transition between Aristotelian scholasticism and the rise of modern humanism. It is said that our father, C.R.C., returning from his travels at Fez and Damka in North Africa and the Near East, returned or retired to a monastery, and there he began the compilation of the encyclopedia of all knowledge. It was his uh, purpose to prepare a work in which everything known to man might be made available to the scholars of this new age. He may have worked very hard, he might have been very industrious in his endeavors, but needless to say, no such a work ever appeared under his name. Nor was any work uh, 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 available at the time at which he was supposed to have functioned. The only actual example of the type of work which he was devoted to was the instauratio magna of Lord Bacon. This was, as Bacon himself declared, to be an encyclopedia of all knowledge, necessary, useful, or possible to man. That he worked and labored through his years to produce this work, we know. And we also know that the Novum Organum, regarded as the first textbook of modern science, was Lord Bacon's masterpiece, and it was the first section of the Instauratio Magna. So here we have a man living at the time when the first manifestos were published, none were published earlier, doing the very work that the author of the unknown uh, book was said to be concerned with. There were many other parallels also. But we must find some explanation for the rise of a sudden point of view. We don't solve everything in this way, but I think we solve something. I think we become a little closer, come a little closer uh, to the necessary foundations of our subject. Mr. Waite, trying to explore his aspect of the field, makes a pretty thorough survey of the alchemists and the alchemistical philosophers who flourished uh, about the time of the beginnings of the Rosicrucian controversy or shortly before that time. He examines their elaborate symbolical works, their mystical theses, and their strange and wonderful formulas in an effort to discover, if possible, a route for Rosicrucianism in this area. Uh, naturally, he fails for the simple reason that these necessary links are not available according to his point of view. There is no evidence, for example, that the alchemistical philosophers ever used any of the essentially Rosicrucian devices or symbols. And there is no proof that the Rosicrucians ever actually made use of the alchemical symbols in any outward or common sense. 
There is only one possible uh, way in which these groups can be linked. There is every possibility that the alchemists were actually concerned with the same end, namely social regeneration, that concerned the Rosicrucian order. But the alchemists were a very spectacular group. Their wonderful old books are filled with the most elaborate diagrams and symbols. Uh, the regularly issued texts of the Rosicrucian society are either unillustrated or but slightly so. They do not make use of these elaborate devices and designs, certainly not in the first circle of the apologists and supposed authors of the works. We may then have parallel motions, motions which might bridge at times. For if there were any Rosicrucians to be discovered, uh, the best candidates are among the alchemists. Also we realize that about the time that these manifestos of the Rosy Cross began to appear, there was a considerable impulse toward the elaboration of alchemical writings. Most of the best texts, most extravagantly illustrated volumes, were issued within 10 or 15 years of the appearance of the Rosicrucian manifestos. There is a package here somewhere, but the two groups seem to have at least a physical separation. They do not intermingle in the common sense of the word, although there are certain indications of possible sympathy between them. Arriving then at the beginning of the historical cycle of Rosicrucianism, we look around to see if we can names or persons that might well be associated with this society. Two names of well-known persons in the chemical and mystical literature of the period stand out. One was the English physician Robert Flood, and the other the German chemist Michael Meyer. Both of these men wrote about Rosicrucianism. Uh, Meyer in particular also wrote considerably about alchemy. The uh, Frankfurt publisher, Theodore de Bry, illustrated many of the writings of both of these men, and also many emblem books and other significant volumes which appeared about the same time. Flood uh, writes quite enthusiastically about the Rosy Cross, gives a long and learned discourse about the habits of the Brotherhood, which actually says nothing, and then at the end states clearly that he claims no membership. This sort of uh, eliminates him uh, unless we wish to assume that he lied in print. Uh, the other possible candidate that we have, uh, Michael Meyer, who was a nobleman and a counselor to his king, uh, does write also about the Rosicrucians. He discusses them and mentions them and describes their habitations in Germany. But before he gets through, he also proves conclusively that he knew nothing about them. The next uh, important work comes out is also by Meyer, called The Laws of the Fraternity of the Rosy Cross. Here Meyer really does quite an impressive job. He writes a small book in which he gives all the rules, laws, and proper uh, credo of the society. Unfortunately, however, he once again says nothing. For all he has done is taken the original material in the Fama and enlarged upon it. He has made extensive definitions of the various rules briefly stated there. But when we get through with the book, he has really added nothing new. So we summarize the situation as it stands in the 17th century. Three books appear. The Fame and Confession of the Society of the Rosy Cross, published in 1614, possibly available as early as 1612, uh, somewhat, sometime in manuscript. It is believed they were circulated. 
and a third work, the, the Chemical Marriage of Christian Rosenkreutz, which appeared two years later. Now, in the Fame and Confession, our illustrious brother, C.R.C., is never referred to by anything except initials. He is delivered to us as Christian Rosenkreutz only in the chemical marriage. Now, the question that must further be established is, from a critical standpoint, is the chemical marriage in any way an actual manifesto of the society? Flood did equally well in writing on Rosicrucian material at the same time, and at the end and insists that he doesn't know the order and has never met a member of it. Meyer did a splendid job and with the same negative uh, conclusion. Uh, therefore, as the Feynman Confession had been in circulation for two years, are we really entitled to assume that the chemical marriage was an actual official production of the society, or was it one of the many loggia that appeared during the next five or ten years? We like to assume, for practical purposes, that it probably was, directly or indirectly, a manifesto. If it can be traced to Bacon, we probably have every reason to assume that it was a genuine work. Whether we can trace the fame and confession to Bacon is not the problem, but here again you can have a lot of fun. It is assumed that the author of all of these works, that is, of the fame and confession, was a German. And, of course, it is assumed that the author of The Chemical Marriage was a German. While these works may have been published in Germany, the German author had some troubles. When he got stuck for a word which might be a little unusual in German, he usually used an English word, which might possibly imply that English was his mother tongue, or it may have been put there on purpose to create this question in the mind of the reader. Anyway, it is a valid question, for in an emergency or in some strange abstraction of learning, of uh, language, uh, it might well be that we would fill in with some word more familiar to us. But let us assume for the moment that these three books were all genuine productions. We have to question the appendix of the Fama Fraternitatis, for in this was to this was added a small work by Boccolini, an Italian author on the universal reformation of mankind. It was all of a theme, but this work only appears in one edition of the Fame and Confession. So here we are with three books looking for an author. These three books stand completely alone, and every effort to tie them successfully to any other group of literature seems to be little better than useless. Uh, Wake comes to this conclusion that these three books stand alone, and then he begins to ask himself whether these books stand, or whether the whole uh, group of volumes fall together. This is a question which I, I don't think we can fairly take. I prefer the more moderate course of assuming that some person or persons with a real and definite purpose and perhaps speaking for a private society devoted to esoteric, mystical, or even religio-political activities did issue these manifestos. That for one reason or another, nothing further transpired. We were assured that these would appear in many languages. Actually, they did not. The only time when they appeared in any other language was much later when they were translated. They were not simultaneously issued in five tongues or anything of that nature. And uh, the various announcements and pronouncements contained within the volumes uh, seemingly never were fulfilled. To show how the situation was in the year of grace 1616, uh, it, it, we might have to compare it to some strange thing that might arise today, where suddenly there would be thrown upon us a most solemn and uh, apparently official document affirming the existence of some strange or secret government uh, and 
inviting us all to join in this great movement for the regeneration of mankind. Uh, small fr uh, fragmentary splinter movements of this kind have appeared at frequent intervals, but have never amounted to anything. So the excitement grew immediately. Men of tomorrowness, whether they were affiliated with anything or not, were greatly moved by the dignity, the humanity, the nobility of these manifestos, and all were most anxious to join. So that at that moment, uh, the society had its best press, and there was a tremendous popular interest. Everybody began to look around, and there's uh, a very interesting contemporary records dealing with this subject. Alchemists began searching desperately because they believed uh, these Rosicrucian brothers or adepts probably had the secrets of the transmutation of metals, the mystery of eternal youth, and uh, the medicine or the elixir of life. So they, uh, they were searching for them. Uh, pro progressive political leaders were very anxious to be affiliated with this organization. Philosophers, scholars, divines, clergymen, even priests, bishops, were doing everything they could to find out where these brothers were. And the, the furor got greater and greater. But there wasn't any address to address a letter to. There wasn't anyone who seemed to be able to give any information whatsoever. Uh, letters sent to mysterious adepts were always returned unopened. Um, at the same time, of course, as well might be expected, a whole group of charlatans masquerading under weird titles and looking important drifted through various communities were immediately identified as Rosicrucians. Uh, but again, these evaporated without very much uh, contribution to the public good. One uh, early description of such an adept is contained in a delightful little book called The Complete History of an Unknown Man. This is uh, exactly what it was. And when you got through with the history, the man was still completely unknown. Uh, the only thing about him that was demonstrable as any of any historical significance was that he was a sort of a Pied Piper, for he uh, went into one ger small German town and whistled all the rats out of the houses. This was his only claim uh, to Rosicrucian identification. Uh, the uh, hopelessness of trying to communicate with these brothers left only one uh, alternative, the want ad column. Now, of course, at that time, newspapers were not really what they are today. In fact, in Venice, newspapers were still being written by hand, one copy for each subscriber. So this wasn't very successful. The only thing that appeared to be feasible was to publish small booklets, oh, 10, 15, 20 pages, some of them only eight pages, in which some aspiring candidate would state his qualifications assure the Brotherhood that he would be their dedicated servant, and to please let him know where to reach them, then these booklets were published in small numbers of 500 or 1,000 and circulated throughout Europe in the hope that they would fall into the hands of one of the brothers, and he in turn would communicate with the aspirant to membership. Probably 50 or 100 of such publications are already known, and there were undoubtedly many more. Again, however, these were not effective because the writers of them, most of them later wrote other works complaining that their first brochures were ignored. So we had this little cycle of literature that uh, only supports the fact that in 1616 the adepts of the Rosy Cross were as difficult to find as they are now. And uh, situations didn't really better much. But we uh, should take uh, go along with some consecutive thought and try to feel out the situation a little further. Gradually, another type of literature arose, 
uh, as the uh, Rosicrucians decided not to speak for themselves, uh, a very interesting but not necessarily enlightening group of apologists appeared. Among the apologists being our friends Meyer and Flood. These apologists would write an elaborate manifesto, thesis, document, or perhaps even a fine large folio in small print. The substance of the book being that if the Rosicrucians wished to remain unknown, it was their right to do so, and nobody had any reason to question it. Well, to wade through 250 pages of medieval Latin to learn this was itself rather disappointing. These apologists, however, gradually developed imaginations, which is not uncommon and is still a practice found among mystical writers. Uh, not being able to learn anything else, they began to decide for themselves what Rosicrucianism was. And uh, by, six, by 1650, we had a dozen or more fine texts on the subject, no two of which agreed with each other, and each one of them propounding to expound the original mystery of the fraternity. I can agree with Mr. Waite in the fact that you can read them all and gain nothing. Some of them are very interesting. Most of them are a bit desperate. Uh, several of them are uh, permeated with a general atmosphere of futility. But after a time, uh, we find another note coming in namely the quest for the fast dollar and even as early as 1650 uh, people were not completely without that little mercenary twist of mind by the 50s and 60s a whole group of self-proclaimed rosicrucians were available to anyone who wished to sample their fare they uh, wrote extensively one of them was uh, john hayden who did quite an elaborate uh, series of works uh, in his holy guide describing the temples, palaces, and shrines of the Rosicrucian fraternity in England. Unfortunately, he failed to give any locations, and therefore uh, we got too, not too much comfort or consolation, but he did write with great erudition. In fact, he had ideas that no one before him or since has uh, ever fallen upon or really adequately quoted. By the end of the 17th century, by 1680 or 90, the situation had reached a dead end. Uh, it passed into a dignified limbo. Uh, the original society had never claimed uh, any uh, distinction by its action. It had never come forth and revealed itself. Its early circle of apologists were gone. The secondary circle were already mingling their Rosicrucian interests again with the stream of alchemy and hermetic arts. And these, in turn, were beginning to wane under the impact of the rise of experimental science. Minds were now turning more to chemistry and archaeology and antiquities and the development of various remedies based upon scientific knowledge. So everything remained comparatively quiet until the beginning of the 18th century, when we had quite a revival of Rosicrucian thinking. This second cycle, uh, however, begins to take on an entirely different color. We now find the subject becoming more and more involved in ritualism and ceremonialism. Uh, the rise of Rosicrucian secret societies. These societies sprang up in many areas. There is no evidence or proof that they had any foundations in the original order, but at that time communication was poor, the public mind was uh, open to almost any innovation, and the general difficulties politically of the countries of Europe seemed to cause people to take particular interest in something of a hopeful, idealistic, or mystical nature. These secret societies did gather into themselves a number of interesting people, some of them rather brilliant people, but it cannot be said that the mainstream of the subject was in any way enriched. In fact, it perhaps was a little impoverished, because now 
the old landmarks were pretty much obscured unless you had the time, patience, and wealth to investigate the original sources. This drifted along through most of the 18th century. And during this time also, we began to find the rise of Masonic fraternities, uh, both regular and irregular, in various parts of Europe. Freemasonry developed a, a kaleidoscope of degrees. Every uh, inventive and ingenious individual had another Masonic rite. Uh, this situation continued to uh, compound itself until there was really no rhyme or reason left in the gradually developing structure of Freemasonry. Finally, in the, near the end of the 18th century, the great Congress of Wilmsbad was brought together, uh, convened for the purpose of clarifying the Masonic situation. Among the uh, delegates at this Congress, by the way, were two names also associated sometimes with Rosicrucianism, the Count Cagliostro and the Count de Saint Germain. These were delegates at the Congress of Wilhelmsbad. As a result of that, Masonry cleaned house and relegated most of its uh, doubtful degrees uh, to the historical and archaeological uh, department. And again, Rosicrucianism uh, waned and became more or less concerned or involved in certain specialized groups of Masonic scholars. The 19th century didn't add a great deal to this picture. Uh, it did, however, clarify the Masonic position in connection with the Rosicrucian order. Uh, movements arose of Masonic research and scholarship, like the uh, Lodge of the Quarter Coronati in London, the Lodge of the Four Kings, which was the great Masonic research lodge, which worked with old beliefs, legends, rituals, degrees, and more or less became involved in the Rosicrucian controversy through the, its overlapping membership. One of the members, Dr. W. Wynne Westcott, was also the head of the Societas Rosicrucianus in Anglia, which was a Freemasonic auxiliary uh, devoted to Rosicrucian studies admission requiring that the candidate be a master mason. Uh, during the latter part of this century, a great American Masonic scholar, uh, General Albert Pike, a sovereign grand commander of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry of the Southern Jurisdiction, received an invitation from Europe to found a Masonic Rosicrucian Auxiliary in this country. I have seen the correspondence in the House of Temple at Washington, and if my memory does not fail me, the letter was answered by General Pike's son. And in this letter, the son points out that his father is now in too advanced years and too heavily burdened with other responsibilities to undertake the establishment of a Masonic uh, research body in, uh, of Rosicrucian interest in the United States so that the Masonic end, as far as this country is concerned, ends more or less in this way, although one small Masonic research group, the Society Rosicruciana in America, was founded and did flourish for a little while in the northern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite. Beyond this point, the Rosicrucian controversy uh, more or less fades out so far as Masonic, alchemical, political, and uh, illuminist problems are concerned. And in the late years of the 19th century and in the opening years of the 20th century, Rosicrucianism took on very largely the aspect of a Christian theosophy and as such uh, did create and does maintain uh, organizations in this country uh, dealing perhaps to a degree with Rosicrucian problems, but very largely concerned with mysticism or with the uh, esoteric aspects of man's life. None of these organizations are able to use any of the original texts as a basic text for their own work, however, because no text of the original order dealing with any of its mystical practices or beliefs is known to exist. Now Mr. Waite takes on another position here, which perhaps is of some interest to us. 
He now assumes that the entire descent of the Rosicrucian society was completely secret, uh, that it is actually impossible to trace either its doctrine or its ritual from any exoteric organization that has appeared, that there are certain fraters or brothers of the society that have, as in the old Pythagorean school, perpetuated their knowledge by selecting disciples to succeed them, and that this small group has descended over a long period of time, and that somewhere here and there, scattered about, are legitimate Rosicrucians. At this point, Mr. Waite becomes extremely hedgy and uh, takes on an atmosphere of almost uh, uh, unctuous humility and leaves us with somewhat the impression that perhaps he might be one of them. But as he doesn't seem to have courage enough to say so, perhaps he shouldn't have brought it up in the first place. Because again, his findings do not indicate any unusual possession of information in this area. The wonderful and strange experiments that defy all human thinking are taking place constantly in the human body. There is nothing more mysterious in the alchemical texts than the mystery of digestion and assimilation in man. There is nothing more wonderful than how food is changed gradually within the stomach into all of the subjective energies necessary for the maintenance of the body. The stomach is the greatest alchemist we have ever conceived of. Yet these processes in nature, being natural, reasonable, and orderly, they seem to tell us that with nature everything is possible. And just as there are laws by which digestion is possible, so these laws operating in space can be understood and can be applied to other related or pra uh, practical purposes. The very principle which makes it possible for man to live at all is the pr principle which, when properly understood, will enable man to live well. Thus man himself becomes and is an alchemist, really whether he knows it or not. But the bringing through of this knowledge into his awareness in a way that he can control it so that by art he can perfect nature enables him to perform the great work so uh, mrs atwood tells us obviously that the great work is a simple fact and that this great work is the perfection of the consciousness of man by means of which this consciousness ultimately retain uh, regains its universal completeness and is reunited with its divine source. Great work is the production of the heavenly man, the production, the production of the universal true principle, which is the elixir of eternal life because it bestows immortality. It is the transmuter of all base metals because it provides the means by which every material element of man's compound nature is transformed into its spiritual equivalent. And it is also the symbol of the removing of the flaws from precious stones and the manufacturing of artificial gems. Uh, the precious stones and the artificial gems relate particularly to man's psychic field where these stones, like the pearl of great price and the rose diamond of the rosy cross, all represent the sole attributes of man, the shining adornments which uh, exist within his own nature. Just as surely also as the San Griel or the Holy Grail, the cup of the blood of the king is the human heart, containing as it does the blood of the king or the blood of life. So this uh, Holy Grail is likewise the ancient symbol of the alchemical vessel in which the transmutation takes place. 
Therefore this transmutation is also a Holy Eucharist. It is the mysterious transformation of the blood and wine into the life and body of Christ. All the legends and fables bearing upon these things have arisen in the consciousness of man who is dimly aware of a mystery which he has consciously forgotten. But locked within himself, man is aware, as Omar so well says, that from his base metals must be filed the key that shall unlock the door they howl without. That actually in man himself is the whole of the hermetic mystery. That all these books are therefore veiled accounts attempting to preserve down through the corruptions of uh, world conditions the same esoteric doctrine that was taught in the sanctuaries of Greece, and Egypt, and India. Yet a new language has been developed and devised. And now Miss Atwood points out one of the interesting and important parallels, namely that this new language that was developed by the alchemists and was gradually taken over by the chemists is the language of a scientific salvation. That in these formulas and rituals, it is no longer simple piety that accomplishes the works. That man is actually capable of a voluntary cooperation with nature in the advancement of all of the works of light. She then has it something that may seem a little difficult for us to comprehend, but I believe that basically she is right. Namely, that the works of light possible to man include not only the improvement of his own nature, but ultimately the regeneration of his world. That actually these works of man represent the power to use light, not only to cleanse the body, the soul, and the spirit, but to cleanse all of nature, to cleanse the air, the earth, the fire. That it is perfectly possible for man to charge the very energy fields of his planet, just as he is charged himself by these fields. And that man, by the uh, development and perfection of his own life, makes all things new again in the world around him, and in this way fulfills the promise that from his own righteousness there shall come a new heaven and a new earth. That the alchemical mystery, therefore, is a kind of chain reaction. And we are beginning to uh, appreciate that such a thing might be conceivable when we begin to think in terms of nuclear physics. We are now in a position where we realize that tremendous energy forces uh, can be loosed which have an incredible and unknown effect upon not only living things, but upon the very fountains of life, the sources of the energies and the powers with which we are concerned. And perhaps Mrs. Atwood would have been very much impressed had she been able to live to realize that in the fission of the atom, we have a proof of the release of infinite life light power from one tiny, almost incredibly small uh, source. We also know that the fission that we have now achieved is only a very partial fission, and that in all probability there is enough energy in each atom to perfect or destroy an entire solar system, all depending upon use. And use is moral alchemy. Use is the power which arises in man, by means of which he becomes a gardener in the garden of the metals, by which he becomes the faithful guardian of the tree of life, upon which grow the stars of all the metals in the Museum Hermeticum. Also, Mrs. Atwood has come to the conclusion that this process must be a completely orderly and exact one. That somewhere along the line in the destruction and decline of the mysteries, 
those aspects of alchemy which were truly scientific were relatively lost. Uh, one of the uh, German princes uh, finally imprisoned an alchemist and set him to work to find the secret of uh, the transmutation of metals. This alchemist never succeeded, but among the experiments which did succeed was the discovery of the formula for Dresden, China. And as a result, this particular king became a very rich and powerful man without the transmutation of metals. And the whole history of alchemy and chemistry has been a history of byproducts. The search for the elixir of life has enriched our pharmacopoeia, has given us numerous devices and inventions, has led to such discoveries as illuminating gas and things of this kind. They were things found along the way by men searching for something else. But it is interesting that in their search along the way they found practical, valuable, and useful things. That they discovered the operations of law, and therefore that it might not be entirely fair to say that chemistry is the same sum of alchemy, a mad mother. Actually, all of these alchemical experiments were based upon certain convictions. But as Mrs. Atwood points out, somewhere along the line, the direct course was lost. Somewhere in the course of man's existence, he began uh, to look around him uh, for a means of applying knowledge. And in this, Mrs. Atwood quotes from the Instauratio Magna of Lord Bacon in which his lordship points out that man in the course of time has learned to apply wisdom to almost everything except himself. He has taken skill and turned it to breeding better cattle or raising more grain to the acre, but he has forgotten in the course of this to turn his skill within himself to the improvement of his own being. This was the difference between alchemy and chemistry, essentially. Chemistry as we know it today is, de is devoted to experimenting with the elements of nature. Alchemy with the elements of nature in man. Always man has had a tendency to look out from himself toward other things and to take the energies which he possesses and direct them to the victory over other things. However, the very laws by which man hopes ultimately to conquer the world are the same laws by which man must finally learn to conquer himself. And alchemy points out that if man first achieves uh, the kingdom of heaven or the transmutation within himself, then all other things will be added to him. For it is said of the powder of the red lion, which is the great powder of the projection of metals, that it will transform into perfect gold 100,000 times its own weight. This undoubtedly refers to something. Uh, we can say that insight turned upon the unknown will transform a hundred thousand times its own mass of ignorance into truth. The virtue will transform many, many times its own mass into common good. In any event, however, uh, the problem was to apply uh, a knowledge of exactitudes toward the great problem, and that is man. Why is this so essentially necessary? Why cannot we ultimately win by simply putting the world in order around man and then permitting man to enjoy this fruit of his own labor? The answer is pretty obvious, that all the changes that occur in the world must first arise within man. Therefore, man cannot ex perfect the experiment in nature until he has perfected it in himself. 
He can continue his undisciplined struggle with nature. He can continue this effort to overwhelm nature by skill alone. But without directive, without insight, without consciousness concerning ways, means, and ends, without vision, the people perish. And without having within his own nature the achievement of the magnum opus or the great work, it is impossible for man to direct nature, to control it, or to turn it to the fulfillments of its own purpose. Until man knows the end, he cannot lead nature to that end. Thus, in some mysterious way, the great experiment must first be performed in man and then in the world. These are the two great laboratories, the laboratory of the human soul and the laboratory of the cosmos. Whenever the rule is found actually and absolutely in one, it will be applicable to the other. For as Hermes Trismegistus has written, that which is above is the same as that which is below. That which is the lesser is the same as that which is the greater. For all things are bound together by the law of analogy. In this uh, pattern then, the search for the inward transmutation must be a search after a science. A science of the handling, the directing, the multiplying, the expanding, the extending, and the transforming of light. This light must come into man, for this light must make reason possible to man. For reason is mind plus light. Love is heart plus light. Strength, even of body, is physical resource plus light. The mystical experience is dedication and devotion plus light. Light must always be the agent of all these things. And if this light be lifted up, it will draw all things to it. And this light is the light which cometh into the world, and lighteth every man who cometh into the world. So the problem, again, is the magnificent chemistry of light. Now, it is obvious that uh, the Atwoods were moving very closely toward the Indian concept of yoga, that they were sensing uh, the same light principle that is also to be found in Mahayana Buddhism, uh, the, the world of the radiance of truth, the world of the eternal light, uh, in which all things live and move and have their being. Now how is this light to be made available? The alchemist said that it had to be extracted from darkness. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. So the base substances seen in the alchemical retort have to do with light hidden in darkness. Just as gold is hidden in the base metals of the earth, just as the life which the small plant takes from the ground comes from the dark mother in which its roots are placed, so everywhere in the darkness of earth there is life, and this life makes things grow. And the vitality of life and nature must in some way uh, be discovered and separated from darkness. It must be as in the opening chapters of Genesis, which according to Mrs. Atwood, absolutely recapitulate the entire alchemical process, and that any chemist thoroughly understanding the first chapter of Genesis can actually transform base metals into gold, physically as well as spiritually. Because in this, or in this section is contained the summary of creation. And this summary of creation is the key to the continuance of creation. For in the world of the metals, creation is forever. In the world of God, creation is continuous. 
Uh, creation is not something that started and then suddenly ceased and only the products went on. The very processes of Genesis are being repeated every instant and will be to the end of existence. For constantly creation is unfolding itself. Constantly light is descending into darkness and darkness in its fullness of term is releasing light again by the mystery of the second birth. So each person is searching for light. And how is he going to find it? How is he going to make this exploration into the dark mystery of base matter in order to ex extract light? In addition to light itself, what is the most common base matter of our existences? Uh, not uh, now uh, in terms of physical materials, but in terms of that which we all have in common. One answer is that we all have the base material of living. Living is something that happens to everything that is alive. Everything that has life right in it lives. Therefore, living is in some way an unfolding of the life-light principle. So each person lives every day. He lives according to his knowledge, according to his insight or the lack thereof. He lives well or badly, according to his own instincts, his selfishness, his nature, and according to the mysterious uh, impulses which plague his psychic integration. But uh, there is this common matter of life or living, and we may call it experience. Where experience is really nothing more than the gathering up of the treasures of the light. And these are the treasures which thieves cannot break in and steal, nor rust destroy. So each day, whether we are aware of it or not, we are experiencing something. And every experience is an experiment in light. Everything that happens to us has a light meaning, but this does not always mean that we know what that meaning is. But into our own reservoirs, our capacities, are stored away these works of the light. And uh, Bacon refers to these also by the same general theme, the works of light. Now the works of light in nature result in growth and purification. The works of light in the experience of man result in a form of knowledge, a form of self-education continuously going on in nature. Everything that man does teaches him something. Only unfortunately man does not always know what he is taught. Therefore he goes on uh, experiencing much and learning comparatively little. But nature preserves in the sudden conscious nature of man that which he has learned. And this becomes, so to say, a supply of crude ore. This is the supply of impregnated material. For in experience, the gold of value is hidden within the darkness of ignorance. And in the alchemical tradition, a dragon was fashioned to symbolize this. And in the Greek legend, this dragon wound itself around the tree of life on which hung the mysterious golden fleece. And it was to discover this golden fleece that Jason and the Argonauts made their great journey. And this was part of a ritual of initiation into the mysteries. So a man's evolution, his process of existence down through time, has resulted in the gradual accumulation of a properly impregnated material. This material is in his memory, it is in his subjective thinking, it is in the background of everything that he is. This impregnated material is the basis of his career, his home, his business, 
It is the reason why he can pass an examination in school. It is the reason why he can fill out an application form when he wants a job. All of this building continuously of light in darkness leads us to the alchemical certainty that there is a continuous process going on in man in which the works of light are achieving victory over the works of darkness. And yet the light and the darkness are together and uh, they are not clearly divisible as Bilby points out. Somewhere the dawn or the break of the aurora light must come. And uh, Mrs. Atwood looks to the Hermetic mystery to try to understand these uh, wonderful occurrences. Uh, taking the alchemical thinking again, you come to such problems naturally as faith, understanding, dedication, discipline. You find that in the Hermetic mystery there has to be some mysterious agent, the active agent of the stone. Now the active agent of the stone is a kind of mordant. It is a catalyzing agent of some nature. And uh, in alchemy, faith plays very much this part because something has to stir uh, this compound, this compound uh, which lies in obscurity. Somewhere the Jason has to go forth and search for the golden fleece. Somewhere in, this, in man's nature there must gradually arise the conviction that there is a mystery and that this mystery can be solved. In ancient times, education included the clear statement of this simple fact, but modern education no longer does include any intimation that there is a mystery, or that it can be solved, or that there is a road or a way that leads uh, to the accomplishment of the universal medicine. So in uh, the alchemical tradition, actually, strange names are given to familiar things. Yet these familiar things are not in themselves simple. They are not in themselves commonplace. Uh, we, we can say that it sounds uh, much of a come down that some elaborate alchemical material should turn out to be faith. But actually, we have no way of knowing the full dimension of faith. It is probably stronger and greater and more mysterious than any physical chemical or element we have ever explored. It is because certain words have lost their meaning, have lost their profundity, uh, that we, we do not recognize the value of valuable words. And one of the most valuable of these words is in itself faith. Faith has some kind of a transmuting power in life. Faith releases light into the soul, even as doubt obscures light. Now in alchemy also, there is always the ancient master. Alchemy constantly refers uh, to some strange wandering adept, some deeply versed and secret one who possesses the knowledge. In the Paracelsian corpus, this is called Elias Artista, or Elias the Artist a kind of mysterious, immortal, wandering alchemist who never dies, who possesses the elixir of life, who has made the great transmutation and goes around the world forever, selecting dedicated and faithful disciples, visiting them in their laboratories and revealing to them the secrets of the arts when their own merits deserve such revelation. Who is the mysterious Elias Artista? The one master alchemist who never dies, who goes on and on, revealing to those who are ready the secret of the stone. One way of looking upon him is quite a simple way, and he is the alchemical tradition itself. He is the one who cannot die because he is 
a great conviction. He is a great mystery locked in human consciousness. But he appears only to those who are worthy. He makes himself known to the alchemist only when this alchemist has prayerfully dedicated his labors to truth and to light. Then he appears and gives the key to the mystery and then vanishes again and is seen no more. This represents uh, Mrs. Atwood's thinking, what we would almost term today the archetypal psychological teacher locked within our own consciousness and locked also within the consciousness of universals. In the root of every integration or organization that exists in nature is the mysterious fact of the immutable mathematical formula upon which that organization is based. Everything in the root of itself is instinctively a work of light. Everything has within its own nature the strange seal of its own identity. Elias the artist is perhaps partly tradition, partly the great story that has come down to us. Partly it is also the subconscious teacher in ourselves, the old one, the folk consciousness that we have. Perhaps it is descended to us in, in our blood, in our heredity. Perhaps it is the symbol of the infinite sequence of previous embodiments by which we have come to our present state. But it is the old one and the true one locked in us, locked in our conscious experience and available only to us when we have ourselves performed the works of light. So the struggle or the labor always concerns with this. And now Mrs. Atwood goes into considerable detail in relation to Neoplatonism, quoting from Plotinus, Proclus, and many of the other mystics of North Africa and Athens, relating to uh, the works of light in terms of the motion of consciousness itself from ignorance to illumination. Illumination being, of course, the final absorption into light. A man's growth as an, as an emetic experience deals with the seven steps of the ladder of alchemy. And this ladder, the Escalar de la Sage, is in actuality the same as the seven steps of Bacon's mysterious ladder of the arts, or ladder of wisdom. In this consciousness ascends through seven steps, represented by the orbits of the planets, which are in turn the alchemical symbols of the elements. Therefore, as the metals and the elements are arranged upon a ladder, or to form the links of the golden chain of Homer, which bound earth to the pinnacle of Olympus, so this ladder of the wise represents the seven ascending levels of human consciousness by means of which man rises from ignorance to universal insight. All this, of course, is theoretically quite understandable, but the question always remains, how is it done? How is it physically, psychologically, or spiritually possible to perform this work? This becomes, of course, the difference between theoretical alchemy and practical alchemy. And it is the method of how this can be done, and not the fact that it can be done, which constitutes the esoteric doctrine in the Hermetic Sciences. Uh, Mrs. Atwood senses this and realizes it, and tries in the light of the study of many of these deep works to put together a formula, a pattern, not now to be used chemically, although she believes, and most alchemists have taught, that the formula for the regeneration of man will also regenerate the metals. But to discover this mystical insight by means of which the human being can achieve the transmutation of his own consciousness from darkness into light or to free the souls of the metals from their bodies in order that they may unite to form the universal medicine. Now all the alchemists have agreed upon one thing, 
namely that you cannot combine the souls of metals, while these metals are in various conditions of their own development. You cannot take the outward bodies of elements and force these bodies together. You cannot take common lead and mingle it with iron and produce anything more than a kind of alloy of lead and iron. These two will not accept each other. They will not become actual uh, souls united. They will only be bodies united and souls in stress. Alchemy creates another symbol, the, the hermetic mercury, the mysterious symbol of the universal solvent. Mercury is said to be the one element that will accept other elements into its own soul. Therefore, Mercury becomes in a mysterious way in the alchemical tradition the symbol of Christ, because also it is the child of the sun and moon, or the offspring of heaven and earth. But even in the case of these elements, the alchemists tell us definitely that crude iron and crude silver cannot be united to produce the mystery. But before these elements can be combined, they must die. For unless the seed dies, says St. Paul, it shall not live again. Therefore, the mystery, like the mystery of the early Christian convert, is the mystery of the firstborn of them that sleep in death. The whole story has to be a story of resurrection. It has to be a story of the rolling away of the stone and of the empty, of the empty sepulcher. It is the story of that which has risen from its own mortality to become the eternal proof and hope of immortality for all creatures. For in the resurrection of Christ, said the old apostles, is the proof of the resurrection of all that lives. This in turn relating to the metals in the alchemical mystery is that the metals must die. They must be crucified. They must descend into darkness. They must pass into limbo, which is the retort or the alchemical vessel. And here they must be caused to suffer, as in a purgatorial, which is a purging or cleansing. And here in the due course of time, they will ultimately be forgiven or restored by the descent of Christ into limbo for the salvation of souls. So now our alchemists tell us that these elements must die. And the question is, what are meant by these elements? I think that the Buddhist would answer that very simply, that these elements are the sensory perceptions and the mental focus. They are the elements that form the mysterious six-pointed star with the sun or self or sattva in the center, the mysterious shield of David of the Jewish Kabbalah. These representing then the psychic integration centers of man representing the powers of the sensory perceptions. These must die in order that their own secret energy may be released again. So that by only by man's victory over the senses is the message or the power or the true reality that is locked in these senses as in the basic matter of experience. Only in this way can it be released. So we come to meditation, to Zen, uh, to practically any of the disciplines of Neoplatonism or the ancient Greeks. For the death of the sensory perceptions is simply quietude, meditation. The absolute relief of man from the pressure of the objective functions of his own composite nature. The man becoming still causes confusion to die in him. And it is the death of confusion that results in the rise of value. 
for when the confusion of the testimony of the senses has been stilled, then the wisdom that is locked in these senses becomes compatible and can mingle. Thus, when the senses and their functions are suspended, the principle of consciousness upon which they all depend is realized in its unity. In other words, the element, the principles, the energies of the senses' perceptions can be alchemically united as long as the senses themselves do not function. So by a complete suspension of the personal, the universal elements within us can come together. But while we continually disturb these elements by our own objective awareness, they cannot come together. Mrs. Atwood feels that this is the burden and part of the Eleusinian mystery ritual, and certainly of Neoplatonism, which is based thereon in the Orphic Rhapsodies, that these tell the story of a mystical suspension of error and illusion, by means of which reality can reaffirm itself, by which the individual will find in principles these things which he cannot discover while he is addicted uh, to the shadows or appearances of things. Let us take a simple example of the point involved, namely take religion. We will imagine that an individual uh, is torn between religion and science. While religion is in its crystallized integration within himself, while religion in him is a series of specific beliefs, while religion has to do uh, with uh, the consubstantiation of the host, while religion has to do with the assumption of the virgin, while religion has to do with the co-eternity of the three persons of the Trinity, while these factors are in consciousness, religion is working in its own way, but it is not assumable with anything else. We go then over to science and we say the why this man is dedicated to biology, so that his universe moves around the center of axis of biological situation. Or he is a physicist, or he is an astronomer, or he is dedicated to any of the works of the light of science. He is then not only involved, but by his own limitations imposed upon his own areas, he cannot even circumscribe the whole boundary of science. He is only working with a little area. A scientist thus engaged and preoccupied, and a religionist thus engaged and preoccupied, cannot meet. They can have certain superficial, friendly relationships, perhaps, but they have no identity, no conscious realization of each other. Yet if either of these was able to completely disassociate his consciousness from any aspect of his react uh, of his labor or reactive work and go to the substance of it. If the religionist could separate religion from theology, if the scientist could separate science from the sciences, in the other words, perform this alchemical reduction to source, then science would realize that the substance upon which it is built is inevitable, immutable, universal law. And the religionist would discover that the substance upon which faith is built is inevitable and immutable, universal law. In their principles, therefore, these two can unite. But once they have become structures, they cannot unite. This is why alchemy says that you have to destroy the outward forms of things. You have to calcinate them. You have to burn them or corrupt them or destroy them until nothing of the body remains but ashes. Then the living spirit within these things can unite. For in all life there is an identity of truth light. 
And this identity of truth, truth life is the secret of compatibility. And compatibility or the union or mingling and identification of these elements finally represents the amalgam from which the great stone of the wise is projected by alchemy. So first, by the reduction of all things to their essences, they become susceptible of union. And out of the union of these divided elements comes the sudden re-experience of the unity of the archetype of life from which they descended. The continual discovery of increasing unities. The ascent from particulars to generals the gradual disintegration of the external natures of things and the re-establishment of their internals. In this way, the great alchemical transmutation takes place. This can be put in terms of chemistry and will probably operate chemically. It can be put in terms of religion and will operate religiously or in terms of philosophy. But in man, the peculiar term of it is in the term of yogic consciousness searching. For the whole redemption of man lies in the reduction of the confusion or complexity of man to the absolute stillness, which is the death of the divided parts. And then from the death of, this, of these divided parts, a spirit rises. The spirit released from confusion, released from difference, from discord, and from the various vibratory patterns of elements, suddenly is restored to its own right, right nature. So in the alchemical tradition, again, the purpose is forever to reduce the bodily interference of things with the unfoldment of the life within body. The grand experiment is therefore to be attained in universal conscious re-identification with the infinite. This means the final elimination of the dross in all things, the transmutation of every base metal into principle, the final falling away of all bodies, illusions, beliefs, creeds, sects, divisions, which exist primarily in the mental nature of man. When these fall away, when these are overcome, when these are relaxed and released so that they no longer interfere, then man gradually brings together the essences of all things. And in the reunion of essences within the living alchemical retort of his own soul, man achieves the great transmutation. He becomes the adept, he becomes the yoga, he attains the samadhi, he becomes the embodiment of the entire discipline of antiquity, which had for its essential purpose the production of the man of light, the production of the luminous androgene, the great complete composite being uh, which is hidden from us by the confusion and complexity of our own mortal existence. So alchemy approached in this way is the burden of Mrs. Atwood's study. And I think as we proceed with it we realize, and we will realize more as we read her work, the tremendous amount of thought and the tremendous amount of insight that went into it. We wonder at the strange story of how it was done. We know the universe works mysteriously. Perhaps in her we had some strange alchemical transmutation by which in the early years of the 19th century she was able to produce this work. In any event, it is a, di a dignified and important volume and certainly one of the worthiest to appear in the interpretation of the Hermetic Arts. Well, I think we'd better let you get your bus and go home now. <laughs>